today's video will be part two of my three-part conversation with Quentin Law, Deputy Mayor of Morristown, New Jersey. Thank you, and please enjoy the content. Right now. We, often we hear um, throughout the course of our life or in college, right, we, we hear people of color say, you stand on the shoulders of giants, or someone laid the foundation for you to get to the next level. Absolutely. So you take me, take me back to maybe either the first election or the second, and when you become the first, right, um, what does that weight feel like? Mm -hmm. um, and what level of responsibility um, do you think that you bear when you become the first? Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I always say is my goal is to be the first, but not the last. Okay. And I want to be remembered as an effective member of town council. I want to be remembered as someone that brought every voice to the table. So when it comes to being the first, it, it comes with a level of responsibility that you don't necessarily expect. You're like, whoa, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of people watching that you can inspire to get into the process. But you have to remember it's like, hey, this is bigger than me. This isn't just about me. This is about my community. This is about all the people that over the 340 years that they lived in Morristown maybe felt like they didn't have a voice. Mm -hmm. So when when I say I stand on the shoulder of gi shoulders of giants, I literally do. My grandmother bought a house 50 years ago in Morristown when they were expanding black housing in Morristown. So they were building roads they were literally building roads my grandmother moved from camden into morristown bought a home 50 years ago um, she was a single mother with two kids at the time taking a chance on her and her family and for 50 years later for her to be able to see and to vote for her grandson to become the first black councilman in morristown history that is what standing on the shoulders of giants means to me because I know what it means to watch someone work multiple jobs to provide for their family and to know that my grandmother at that point in time was working up to four jobs and owning her own business to support her two kids and her family. And even more than that mm -hmm. is all the fuel and inspiration that I need to continue to battle day in and day out against any obstacle that I see. And, and even those days where I'm like, wow, you know, there's no one there, you know, there might be a challenge that I feel like I can't overcome. I think about that history and I'm like, you know what, that's, it's bigger than me. It's not about Quinton in this moment. It's about all the people that felt like they've been out of the process over the last 340 years. Okay. How did you overcome speaking in public, right? So some people are just born with it. Some people um, just have to get pushed into it. Mm -hmm or some people um, develop the necessary skills to be a professional orator. So tell me about your experience uh, with speaking in public. Well, I think first things first I'll say is a lot of people don't know that I actually, um, I, I do trip over my words sometimes. I, I repeat words um, and sometimes I struggle with finding the right thing to say. So public speaking isn't always the easiest thing for me. Mm -hmm. It's never been. Um, and even to this day, it's like I was a, I played football in college. And every time I go into a big speech, I feel like I'm in the tunnel for a football game. <laughs> uh -huh. I'm like, you know, it's one of those things where the excitement's building and the, and the tension is building. But once you do that first play and once in, in the speech, once you speak that first word, then the rest starts to flow. So to this day, I still feel nervous until I go up to speak. Um, I don't know if it shows or not, mm -hmm. but it's been a long road for me, especially as someone that, you know, I always, sometimes I do repeat words. Sometimes I do mess up my sentences. I'm by no means a perfect orator or, or, or that in any fashion. Um, but I believe that practice makes perfect. Mm -hmm. And dedicating yourself to that. What I've seen is a lot of people say, hey, public speaking is not for me. I don't like doing it. <laughs> uh -huh. You know, they what, they say people, some people fear public speaking more than death. Uh -huh. You know, so I can understand how someone's like, you know, it's not for me. But once you jump in mm -hmm. and once you 
put some of the insecurity and just like fear of the unknown aside and really put yourself out there, which takes a lot of courage. But once you do it, mm -hmm. you are like, okay, I did it. I did it. You know, when's the next time that I can get in front of folks and, and speak my mind or say something that I'm passionate about? And over the years, over the time that you spend speaking in front of folks, I found that you get better and better every time. And that has helped me because as someone, by no means am I out there doing a Barack Obama, you know? <laughs> like yeah. that, to watch someone like them that are these politicians that are at the highest levels, absolutely inspiring crowds and insane, you know, going in the soliloquies that are like just out of this world. That's not who I am. Uh, but I feel that people connect with the aspect of me being honest and upfront about who I am and who I am is I'm a real person that mm -hmm. struggles sometimes with what they want to say. And I speak from the heart and sometimes my heart doesn't know right there and then, but once you can accept that, Hey, you're not going to be the perfect speaker all the time, but if what you're saying is genuine and has value, okay. that's when you'll connect with people. So that's in my public speaking journey. That's what I found. But even to this day, I'll give a speech and I'm like, uh, <laughs> I can do it a little bit better. Uh -huh. So I always try to, you know, take it back to my football days. And after I get done a speech, I'm like, all right, if I recorded it, can I watch it back? And how can I do better? I mean, even after this podcast, I'll probably watch it back and okay. try to see how I do better. Okay, yeah. good, good, good. I, I, I think that's point well taken. Um, I think we all get the jitters, right? When you start something new or um, because we think we're under a microscope. And what I've also learned too is like sometimes even when we have job interviews yeah. or uh, we have different speaking engagements where we're, there, we're the person that people came to see. We don't know what you're going to say, right? Yeah. And I think we, so we have to realize that we have control or power. You're the vessel that someone else has that particular thought. And if you're able to articulate that, whether you're giving a speech or um, you met somebody on the campaign trail um, who told you a story that um, that you need to share with somebody else to inspire Absolutely. someone else. So I think it, I think that's a, that's a good thing when you can overcome those challenges of speaking in public because, you know, you can deliver that message, your message, mm -hmm. as well as somebody else's message and connect with other people. Absolutely. Thank um, you. As far as like. Um, having fun. What is it like out campaigning, right? Knocking on those doors and, um, you know, having those early morning um, door knocking campaigns. Yeah. Um, what is that experience like? So that's, you know, that's honestly one of the most enlightening things when you're out on a campaign because you're not going door to door and catching people on a Saturday or Sunday <laughs> morning and saying, hey, you know, I'm your local councilman. And what are the, you know, issues in your community that mean the most to you? And, mm -hmm. and I think that, you know, you learn so much through those conversations, but you also have funny interactions, you know, people holding off their dog, <laughs> trying to talk to you. Yeah, you got my vote. And then, you know, people that are like, oh, well, tell me, you know, how you feel about the lake and everything that's happening down there. So, you know, sometimes you have to know all the, like, uh, specific details on an issue but sometimes it's just about connecting with someone and then when they see you sweating showing up at their door because you've been walking all day talking to folks in their neighborhood they're like you know what I like that guy you know he's mm -hmm. putting in the work and he's willing to show up and come to my door on the weekend and ask me how he, they can be a better council person not many people do that. And it's not an easy thing to do to go knock on people's doors. So I'm grateful for everyone who sacrifices their time to knock to knock on their doors for my campaign. Um, but it's one of my favorite things to do when it comes to knock uh, to, to campaigning is just connecting with folks and getting being able to talk to them and show them that not only am I willing to do the work for you at Town Hall, but I will show up for you on the weekend at your door to hear directly from you um, what issues are happening to you and your family. So I know you were in council, mm -hmm. city council before you, you know, transferred to deputy mayor, but how has that transition been? And what are some of like the enlightening moments? Yeah. So I would say, as I mentioned earlier about, you know, patience and persistence, right? Mm -hmm. Understanding that government moves slow. Some people get frustrated at that and, and then they want to bow out or they want to, shut themselves off from the, the government and the civic engagement process. 
Uh, anyone that's watching this video, I promise you, do not let your inability to do everything stop you from doing something. Taking that one step forward, taking starting today, you might not solve the, all the issues of the world tomorrow, but you're starting. And half of the people don't even start because the problem is too big. They feel like they can't attack it. So one of the biggest things that I learned is to not let your inability to do everything stop you from doing something. And that collective effort over the years of doing just a little bit of something every day can make a larger difference. So I would say that that is one of the biggest lessons that I've learned from being out there campaigning because there's gonna be days where you knock on someone's door and they're like, hey, you're the best thing since sliced bread. Uh -huh. And then there's days when you knock on somebody's door and they're like, you don't have my vote. And you're like, wow. You know, it takes a lot out of you. Mm -hmm. But you're like, you know what? I'm not gonna fix all the issues in Morristown tomorrow. Not everyone's gonna vote for me. If they did, that would be crazy because <laughs> uh -huh. politics just isn't like that <laughs> yeah yeah but if i can make that small difference and that marginal difference and just get one percent better or make one percent of a difference every single day 365 days later i can look at a difference that is substantial when way more substantial than when i started on day one so that's the philosophy that i operate with in government um, but I'm trying to operate with that uh, in my in my entire life. Okay, awesome, yeah. awesome. Okay, so that leads me to the next question, right? So often, sometimes when we have people in the um, public arena, right, um, whether you're on TV or you're a public figure at the local level, um, the term role model is oh. often um, <laughs> is often applied, right? Yes. Because when you're able to influence others um, outside of your immediate circle. People say, okay, you're a role model. Um, what does that mean to you? And do you think that applies to you as far as like the term role model? Yeah. Well, I'm 26 now. When I first got into office, I was 23. I, what I'll say is that if I answered this question when I was 23, I would probably have said, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm a role model. I'm just a council person. I'm just a, doing a small job in a small town. Mm -hmm. I don't see how anyone could look at that and feel that, oh, I'm inspired or, you know, oh, I look up to that person. Mm -hmm. like, you know, I'm just deciding, you know, when the road gets paved. <laughs> um, but three years later, I have seen the impact of what, being on your local government can do to the community and can do to people. Mm -hmm. And and I've seen that whether I want it or not, I am a role model. And the decisions and actions that I take on a day-to-day -day basis affect people, whether I want to or not. Mm -hmm. And what I have to realize is that the the actions that we take on a, lo on a local government level affect people's lives closely. Mm -hmm. Our day-to-day -day lives are affected by local government. You know, and a decision that we might make at a park can affect, you know, I, we've, there's been times where we've made a decision and I think it's the most minuscule thing. And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, we're approving it. You know, it's just a road paved. Mm -hmm. And then I have someone that pulls me aside and they're like, thank you so much mm -hmm. for paving my road. It's been 30 years. I've been driving over <laughs> potholes and I had to fix my car twice. And, you know, you just hear so many stories. You're like, wow, the things that we're doing have such a tangible effect on someone's life. Um, so I really have learned to embrace mm -hmm. the, the idea of being a role model and understanding that, hey, people look up to their local government officials. That means people are looking up to me. And I may have been a 23 year old three years ago that didn't want to be anybody's role model. Mm -hmm. But today, I am I am somebody's role model, and I have to act the part. I have to represent my community to the best that I possibly can because I'm not here just speaking for myself anymore. It's bigger than me. I represent Morristown, and we have a reputation to maintain. And I take that with the utmost seriousness because this is the community that has literally given me the tools to be in the position that I am to, in today. 
So I see that it's only right to give back to that community and serve as a role model. And if that's giving back through mentorship or investing into the community through my government role, I will do that because I understand that we, if, if someone didn't look at me and empower me, then I wouldn't be in the position that I am today. So I want to inspire someone else to serve their community so we can continue to be the great community that, you know, you and I both know we are. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned for part three of the conversation coming soon.